Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. We're going to give people a couple minutes to get logged on um, before we get started. So please just hang tight. Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Um, we're going to give people another minute or two to get logged on before we get started. Okay, uh, a couple of administrative issues. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us. Um, this is what, what is now a monthly Wednesday webinar in um, the University of Washington School of Public Health. Um, and I wanted to let you know, in case you haven't joined us previously, um, that we use the Q&A function for asking questions to the presenter. Um, so um, as opposed to the little raise hand or um, the Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A window. And um, we do use the chat function um, to um, uh, post links and things like that. So we may be putting links and, and references and resources in there for you, but that's, that's what we use that for. Um, and uh, let's see, what else do I need to let you guys know? I am not going to do a land acknowledgement today, even though that's how I usually start because Wendy Barrington, who's our speaker today, um, is going to do the land acknowledgement herself. So with that, let me introduce Wendy. Oh, wait, I, I did actually promise that I was gonna say one thing about COVID before we got started. So wait, hold on the introducing Wendy thing. So um, I was swearing we weren't going to talk about COVID at all today. Um, and then just literally an hour and 15 minutes ago, Public Health Seattle and King County um, issued a press release about um, lifting the current um, mask mandate, um, which Inslee had already announced would, um, the state would be lifting as of Friday, but the local one will be lifted as of March 1st and also that the um, outdoor mask mandate, um, that the vaccine verification policy that was implemented in October for um, King County for entrance to um, venues like restaurants um, will be lifted also as of March 1st. The key piece of information here is that, that that does not directly impact us at the University of Washington School of Public Health the University of Washington campus in the sense that our guidance that we follow is the university's policies. And those policies are um, dictated by what the guidance is across the state um, for institutions of higher education. So don't think that like you can automatically just rip off your mask starting uh, March 1st. Um, you need to keep your eyes peeled for what the updates are to our UW policy 
That being said, there's a lot of change going on right now at the federal, state, and local level. So you're going to see a lot of stuff in the news in the coming weeks. Um, and I would say, again, just please, it takes us a little while to catch up at UW um, to get all of everything processed and, and changed. So until you hear officially that things are changed at UW, um, please continue to wear your masks. Um, so with that, that's the end of the COVID. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Wendy Barrington. Wendy is our inaugural director of the Center for Anti-Racism and Community Health. She's an associate professor um, in two departments in the School of Public Health, um, Health Systems and Population Health, HSPOP, um, and also epidemiology, and also has a primary appointment in the School of Nursing. And um, we are so thrilled that you are on board, Wendy. This is, and it's such a great time to be launching ARCH and hearing about your vision um, in time for Black History Month. And um, just really, I, I think people are gonna be super excited to hear what your vision is for the center, um, how they can get involved, how they can support you. And so I'm not gonna take up any more of your precious time other than to say, we're, we're thrilled to have you here and super excited to hear what you have to say. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to, to be here. I'm just gonna start sharing my screen and um, looking forward to talking to you today about opportunities for transformation um, as we are visioning and building out the center together. So first, before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Washington was built on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples, land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, and pay our respects to elders, both past and present. I make this acknowledgement and recognition of the longstanding processes of U.S. colonization that have and continue to harm, devalue, and erase Native communities I make this acknowledgement and recognition that these processes are the foundation of our current social hierarchy and inform mechanisms of structural racism. I invite you to interrogate and disrupt these processes in our own environments through the work of the Center for Anti-Racism and Community Health or the ARCH Center. And I include a link of resources um, there to learn more about land acknowledgements as individuals as well as um, institutions. In addition to making a land acknowledgement, I must also make a labor acknowledgement for those who were kidnapped and forced to build this very country. Black History Month was created to not only teach the essential part of American history, but to also celebrate the rich cultural heritage, triumphs, and beauty of African Americans. Today, I share with you an artist that I've recently been introduced to, Lisa Butler, whose pieces of fine art are created by quilting. This year's theme to Black History Month is Black Health and Wellness, which is so salient to what I'll be sharing with you today. Um, I will be featuring the incredible contributions of Black scholars to public health and the genesis of the Arch Center. Um, just to give a quick um, outline of, of what I hope to share with you today, really um, starting off by laying the foundation in, in terms of, of how we're orienting ourselves in, in spinning up the center. Um, then beginning to kind of talk about the processes for, for building out the center, specifically with respect to um, the structures that we're developing and the strategic invite, uh, advisement that we are incorporating as a part of that. It's not just advisement, it will also be um, incorporating decisional authority among um, communities in terms of prioritizing um, what ARCH is doing and how it is doing it. And to that end, talking about the visioning for ARCH and working objectives, as well as um, our agenda and action steps. And then I'll have some time at the end. I'd love to engage with you in, in questions or answers or discussion more broadly. So I now preface all my talks with a land acknowledgement to scaffold my contextualization of um, my research because colonization was the seminal process leading to our racialized society in this country. And this racialized context is a setting in which we all operate within as individuals, as researchers, as institutions, as communities. We must 
revisit history and critically interrogate and name events, their purpose and their impacts. We start with the examination of how Western Europeans began to consolidate resources and create ideologies to support that effort. Specifically colonization and capitalism as means of acquiring land and resources. These groups wielded genocide, enslavement and assimilation to sustain and perpetuate these ideologies. And it was imperative therefore to identify a social hierarchy to justify who would be the agents of these ideologies and who would be the targets. And the concept of race was created to visibly identify agents and targets. However, by understanding the agents as Western European or white men and their socialization at that time, we begin to understand the underpinnings of white supremacy culture and how it structures not only racism, but other systems of oppression, including sexism, heterosexism, and ableism, um, just to name a few of the isms. So I always say I'm, I'm not a historian or a sociologist by training, so I'm not an expert in these phenomena. And yet, I still believe we need to have a basic understanding to not only do our work um, to address disparities specifically in health, um, but also to govern and kind of inform our own existence in society at large. I, I posit that we all need to exercise this examination of positionality within each of our disciplines. So as health sciences researcher and educator, this is imperative because of the role research in medicine has played in providing quote unquote evidence in support of the concept of race and therefore racism. Clearly and understandably, there is a chasm of mistrust between communities of color and public health and healthcare researchers and practitioners. And by not confronting history, however, one has no true appreciation of the reasons why. Um, so we in health research and practice are called upon to contribute to reconciliation and repair. And so I just would really like to ground our conversation with, with that um, orientation. So to facilitate um, our ability to be able to engage in, in that work, I really um, call upon um, public health critical race praxis as a framework um, developed by Dr. Chandra Ford and Colin Zari Hembwa um, for really being able to integrate critical race theory and anti-racism principles in public health research, but also practice, um, as well as just how we are interacting within our academic environments. And so this was actually the framework that I originally presented um, in my job talk for the um, ARCH position. Um, and I like to invoke it again to describe my approach for spinning up the ARCH Center. And you'll notice that there are some key um, principles here listed on the slide, really recognizing the primacy and ordinariness of racism and how that has informed our structures um, through which we all are able to operate um, and being able to use the social construction of knowledge, how that has been limited, and then finally needing to um, bring in critical approaches and disciplinary self-critique to be able to undo um, the limitations that we have imposed in terms of deciding who gets to create knowledge and how that knowledge gets to be created and how that knowledge is used and who gets to use that knowledge. And in doing so, we really need to invite in um, the voice of those who have been most impacted by structural racism. Um, Dr. Ford calls this and I would like to kind of use this as a framework for what I'm going to call radical inclusion. But in order to really do that, we also need to invoke um, the principle of intersectionality. And so intersectionality has morphed um, into conceptualizing how identity is not singular, but plural, that identities can be interrelated and sometimes contradictory, and that oppressions are shaped by these inter, um, identities are interlocking. Um, but the, the reason that critical race theorists Kimberly Crenshaw and others introduced this concept was to explain how racialization occurs within other dimensions of identity, specifically how Black women were not being represented in feminism. So that even within single dimensions of identity, that hierarchy will still exist based on power that confers advantages and disadvantages. And if racism isn't attended to um, primarily, that that's in which that's along the lines in which those power asymmetries will be patterned. 
So now if in taking an intersectional approach, one might think that it might not matter which unit of identity you stratify by first, if you will, but just kind of hearkening back to what I just said, I'd like to push back on that because racism in white supremacy culture fuels all of, of the social hierarchies that we are experiencing in, in this country. And as an epidemiologist, the absolute burden of disparities in morbidity and mortality due to racism from disproportionality in COVID-19 infections and deaths to the killing of unarmed black and brown people in this country is unparalleled. And the mechanisms driving these disparities inform the, the racialization of all communities. Meaning these, these structures have been instituted, they've morphed over time, they were initially put into place for specific communities, but as additional communities have come in, they are also subjected to these processes. Um, and so it's therefore for this reason that critical race theory and intersectionality provide an approach for identifying and rectifying power asymmetries between all social identities generated and propagated by white supremacy culture. And it is for this reason that I believe taking an anti-racist approach will facilitate the liberation of all and that we really must do so in solidarity. So my conversations with partners, collaborators, students and members of affected communities have just been so essential to the evolution in my thinking. And I, I really, I can't name all of you, but I, I, I am so incredibly grateful and thank you for your continued thought, collaboration, partnership, and being able to bring ARCH into being. And so it's really I've just conversations that I've even recently just had with students as part of the Dean's Advisory Council um, for students, for conversations that I've just had with the Black Advisory Collective, which I'll um, be telling you more about in just a moment, have really been crucial in crystallizing my communication about the ARCH approach. People have asked, why center Native and Black peoples in the thinking and action coming from the center? Won't that exclude other communities who also may experience racism? And that is a very, very valid question. And my answer to this is two-pronged. The ideology of white supremacy culture and the practice of settler colonialism to perpetuate it hinged upon the consolidation of land and resources in this country. The experience of Native peoples in this country, therefore, is seminal. The experiences of Black people brought to this country is inextricably tied because of their role to work the land that was stolen and build the physical infrastructure and wealth generating capacity of this country for a few. These mechanisms are intertwined. We must therefore work in solidarity to disrupt these seminal processes, both black and native peoples. So why do these, um, why does this effort apply to other communities? Because these mechanisms have evolved to perpetuate these historic insults racialize new immigrant populations to maintain white dominance and socially stratify white populations to maintain elite and patriarchal dominance. And these mechanisms are intertwined. We must work in solidarity, therefore, with Black Natives and white people and communities of color. All of us are affected by these processes of racialization. Domination is not healthy for anyone, and we have policies, practices, and norms so steeped in domination that guide our every thought and action, regardless of intention. So here's a position from which ARCH is moving. We need to center the experience of Native and Black peoples to interrogate racist mechanisms in US systems. We need to recognize that racism in the process of racialization of all peoples in the US is buttressed by anti-indigeneity and anti-Blackness. And so there's, it's almost like twofold in terms of, of deconstructing this process of structural racism. It's understanding how these mechanisms of subjugation are now experienced by other communities along identity intersections that I've listed examples here, but it's also to understand how the racialization perpetuates the continued subjugation of Native and Black peoples. And so therefore, you know, we, we need to take an intersectional approach in being able to understand this and disrupt it. It's not just about describing and understanding, it's about taking action to make these processes stop. So 
a guiding framework, again, coming back to, uh, to the public health critical race praxis that I've been using to help me think through how ARCH can engage in, in this space is, is really um, also would like to um, acknowledge the work of Drs. Kimmy Dole and Cindy Snyder, um, as well as Chandra Ford, and in, in, in essentially explaining this four phase approach with respect to understanding racism and racialization and co-creating solutions with communities to disrupt it. So really centering and uplifting black and indigenous voice to establish arch priorities, approaches and structure, and then using that to identify anti-racism, no do gaps and priorities with effective communities. So communities that may want to interrogate how their racialization has has manifest and then what are possible strategies that can be co-created to disrupt those mechanisms. So this you'll note is really kind of having a, a, a feedback mechanism, a feedback loop in, in, in that we are informed, um, we're doing, and then we're measuring, we're evaluating, and we're you know informing our paradigms again and our approaches and it's iterative. So with respect to the Arch Center for Structure and Advisement, um, would want to also just acknowledge um, the image credit from Carolyn Fan. Thank you so much. She is um, a health systems and population health PhD student who worked with me over the summer on a project that I'll tell you a little bit more about. And, and that uh, image that she created for that project has, has also been um, used to inform our approach for having a, um, shared leadership structure that is not hierarchical. That's that's the goal. So uh, the flower of power as, as she calls it, and really these five petals being myself as the director, the Black Advisory Collective, um, the Indigenous Advisory Collective, the Community Advisory Board of Community-Based Organizations, and then the Student Advisory Board, um, which I'm really excited to be working with um, the Dean's Advisory Council for Students to spin up that process to establish that that entity. I'd also like to um, share with you, I'm very excited to be in community with anti-racism center directors. Um, we're establishing a collective where we are going to be able to support, amplify, reinforce um, our own work within our own centers, but then um, craft a national agenda for health equity action. So very excited to be um, in com communication and in solidarity with Drs. Rachel Hardeman at University of Minnesota, Chandra Ford at UCLA, Sherelle Barber at Drexel, and Melody Goodman at NYU. So the overarching vision for ARCH is to interrogate and disrupt processes of racism and racialization of all populations across the life course that perpetuate health disparities while centering the knowledge and experience of those most impacted by the legacies of US colonization. So this is our vision. And um, ultimately our goal is to be able to build an evidence base of effective and anti-racist strategies to serve the liberation of all communities, of all people. So I strongly believe that orienting the center around the disruption of racist mechanisms rooted in white supremacy culture norms that perpetuate anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity across identity spaces will expand the conceptualization, the discourse, and the venues for rectifying power imbalances. So this expansion is necessary because white supremacy culture norms, which I would equate to dominant social norms in this country, always push us away from spending concerted and sustained intention and energy to uplift Black and Indigenous communities. Because our country would not exist without the subjugation of these populations, and perhaps our collective social consciousness or unconsciousness fears that we will no longer exist without this continued sub subjugation. And that is true, because that existence will be no longer as we transform to a different one. So we are really in a critical social moment right here, right now. Never is transformation more possible than when there is upheaval, uncertainty, or unhappiness, when there is commitment, integrity, shared vision, and accountability. So I invite you to step with me into that transformative space because it's not possible without you, and it is not possible to remain comfortable. I am learning to embrace the transformative space and the discomfort, emotional labor, and uncertainty it brings because it also offers tremendous opportunity. For our 
working arch objectives. And, and you might have noticed because if you've been in other spaces where I've presented in the past, um, these are actually evolving over time. As I continue to be in dialogue um, with community partners, with faculty, staff, and students within the UW, um, without, um, within our peer institutions. So these objectives are evolving. And I hope that, I hope, I want you to notice that. Because um, it's always been very important to me that the creation of ARCH is not just about me. It's not just about my ideas. It's about our collective ideas. So to develop an evidence base for anti-racist uh, anti -racist research methodology, methodologies and interventions to address racialization of communities and the perpetuation of anti-indigeneity and anti-Blackness. So I hope that everyone can see themselves in that first objective. We also want to nurture and develop Black and Native and anti-racist scholars specifically. And um, this is really to attend to the systematic um, exclusion, the forced um, assimilation, the forced marginalization, um, especially within the sciences. We want to establish and transform institutional structures using partnership frameworks to support community-driven anti-racist research and practice. And we want to establish a foundation for critical race theory and decolonizing principles in the School of Public Health in research teaching, practice, and service. And as I mentioned, we want to do this in a participatory fashion. So I'm going to share with you another framework that I'm thinking about, but it's all about attending to partnership dynamics um, to be able to recognize that um, we are in context, that we are in relationship, and that that is just as much part of the work as the activities that we may be um, engaging in in service to health equity. So at the, at the, I guess at the, at the crux of, of kind of my approach in thinking about how we can specify anti-racist strategies, it's really for me about disrupting white supremacy culture norms. And I don't know if you're familiar, but I highly recommend you check out the scholarship of Tima Kuhn, and she has described um, these um, essential norms that kind of undergird white supremacy in and how it is operating in an everyday fashion, meaning how it's operating in terms of how we relate to one another, how institutions are functioning, um, um, et cetera. And they're listed here. And so I'm not gonna read them all off to you, but the, it, you look at it and you're, you're thinking, you know, this is not complicated. Um, and it's not complicated. It's, it's about being able to be intentional to not perpetuate power asymmetries, to be able to um, share decisional authority, to be able to expand the way that we uh, value um, and think, um, and to be able to do so um, through centering at the margins, which is what I mentioned before as, as what I call radical inclusion. So our action agenda for our first um, primary way of working is to be able to partner to identify ways to disrupt white supremacy culture norms in own context of collaboration, practice, or being. Because recognizing that each context is unique, it's different, not, uh, not necessarily one strategy is going to map onto every single context and making that really kind of concrete um, in terms of um, putting forward um, strategies um, that are most affecting, for example, um, faculty and, and the recruitment and retention of faculty. And I'll be sharing you uh, sharing with you a little bit more exactly what I mean um, about that. But that we all have different um, units, different departments within the school. Um, I'm working with different units in terms of being schools and colleges. So there are all the different kind of paradigms that undergird these different um, cultures in the units. There are different ways uh, in which um, the, the science is conducted, and that all needs to be taken into account. Um, and so this really is a participatory process. I can't tell you this is what you need to do. I can hopefully work in partnership with you for us to figure out what we need to do. So really the first thing I've been um, 
really, again, just so incredibly grateful for the brain trust that I've um, surrounded myself with in terms of thinking this through, being able to interrogate how language and narratives maintain power structures rooted in colonial violence. So the settler colonialists created um, narratives to justify you know, the stolen land and the violence and the victimization that came along with that. So we have these thoughts about rugged individualism, these origin stories to kind of um, reify and, and, and rationalize um, the taking over of lands and, and the um, continued oppression of certain peoples. So this idea of trailblazing, of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, um, being able to have the American dream, if you work hard enough, you'll succeed. All of these are, are narratives that only serve a few. And so also in terms, and in terms of words that we use to establish and maintain our norms of knowing and doing. So words such as excellence and stakeholder, both of these are rooted in white supremacy culture. The first, excellence, is used to signal a very limited conception of what is good or best. It aligns with the white supremacy culture norms of perfectionism and that there is only one right way of performing. The second stakeholder can be used to reflect a power differential between groups and has a violent connotation for some tribes and tribal members. It also groups all parties into one term despite potential differences in the way they are engaged or interact with a project or activity. And so this issue is precisely raised by um, my Promotora partners in a project I'll share with you a little bit more about in the next slide. Specifically that this word connotes a type of relationship that is not valued by their communities, a relationship that's grounded in capital investment and the values that surround capitalism. So really being intentional in terms of, of, of language. I mean, even the fact of, of the, that our um, disciplines that are you know, academic enterprise is so, um, reliant on the written word, that in itself is exclusionary in that there are communities in which oral histories um, are the ways in which knowledge is generated and sustained and passed on. So how are we going to be able to kind of bring in opportunities for us to think differently in terms of how we communicate and, and how we value that communication? So also disrupting um, the exercise of power or dominance to minimize or exclude. And this can be intentional or unintentional. A lot of behaviors that we all have been socialized to do serve this purpose, whether we mean for them to or not. And so to be very clear eyed and, and kind of being able to identify when that is happening and, and put strategies into place to disrupt that. And then finally, centering the ways of knowing and being of those most impacted to inform these intersectional approaches that we really need to, to implement in order for us to have rigorous and relevant strategies. So a second um, action agenda for us is to serve as an evaluative hub for community-driven implementation of anti-racist strategies. So I'm going to give some examples of two projects that the Arches is, is currently involved in, very excited. The first being um, to serve as the um, external evaluator um, using anti-racist principles in the evaluation of a program that is promotora-led um, for strengthening of community clinical linkages to support COVID-19 response efforts. This is through um, the Washington Department of Health very excited to be able to partner with promotoras and being able to decide how are these different program components going to be implemented? How are practice partners, how are they needing to change? How are they needing to change their institutional cultures in order to support the collaboration with promotoras and CHWs or community health workers in the region? Um, because again, a lot of, of, of our um, health systems um, larger organizations are very hierarchically structured. How are we going to expand the way that those um, practice partners operate so that they can really be able to engage in a way that is not um, inflicting a power dynamic and therefore um, serving to exclude? We're also um, 
being able to engage with community-based organizations of color to inform anti-racist change strategies for large organizations as part of Public Health Seattle King County's Pandemic and Racism Community Advisory Group. So ARCH just recently um, presented a proposal to that group to see if this would be um, an, uh, an endeavor that the group would be interested in supporting and specifically targeting um, large organizations as, as large institutional um, um, entities that are really kind of at the root of a lot of the structural issues that are um, driving inequities in terms of services being delivered to communities of color, as well as communities that coalesce along other identities that have been systematically excluded. So um, very excited to be able to begin to do this. The way that we're envisioning it, um, the UW is going to be presenting um, some organizational change strategies as a part of um, our UW FIRST implementation, which I'll be sharing with you in just a moment. Um, Public Health Seattle King County has committed to, to um, participating as an organizational partner. And then we are still working to, uh, to finalize the participation of a third partner. But what we're, what we're planning on doing is really uh, working together as a, as a, essentially as a learning collaborative in a fishbowl type of environment where we can actually um, identify um, what are the possible change strategies that need to occur work with community-based organizations of color to identify are these change strategies salient are the what needs to change what needs to be prioritized um, we can go back we can implement and we can report out as a mechanism of accountability as to what we're doing and what are the changes that we're seeing as a result of the um, effort and the resources being put into that um, change strategy so we are we are pre-implementation. I believe we have support to move forward. And I'm really excited to finalize that third partner in that effort. We also want to support anti-racist organizational transformation within the uh, School of Public Health at UW as well as beyond. So I have been um, really happy to be working with the Health Promotion Research Center for several years as a part of their um, external evaluation team for the breast, cervical, and colon health program. And um, as a part of that effort, I've just been really amazed to be able to partner and think through different ways in which not only the program can be implemented in terms of like the structure of delivery, but also in terms of how we are measuring and evaluating the effectiveness of this program. So very excited um, to kind of continue in that work as a co-investigator. And then finally, we're also um, wanting to shift our own organizational pra practices. Um, this is a, a, a proposal that we just put into NIH. It's gonna be reviewed in on February 28th. So um, we don't know how how our proposal has been received yet, but I will definitely um, keep you updated. But the premise of the proposal is really to shift organizational policies, practices, and norms to facilitate the recruitment and retention of a diverse faculty body. And that is going to include um, shifting our faculty surf and promotion tenure and review criteria, the processes, the practices in which that is occurring. The thing that's been really awesome is that, like I said, there are units across campus that are doing this work already. So that is about how can we apply um, lessons learned best practices and be able to implement them more, uniform, more uniformly across multiple contexts, re recognizing, of course, that some of these strategies are going to be tailored um, to fit those specific contexts. Um, we're also establishing an anti-racist faculty cohort model and mentoring program. And um, ultimately, we are putting into place specific um, strategies to attract fac faculty from groups systematically excluded from science. So this was uh, something that we are talking about in terms of diversifying the scientific workforce, diversifying the faculty here at the UW. And this is something that is incredibly supported by community-based organizations of color. And so this is what I'll be reporting out on to them as a part of that, um, that um, fishbowl activity that I just described. 
I would also just really like to thank um, the leadership that coalesced around me to put forward this application, um, Drs. Tamani Coker and Pamela Collins um, as multiple PIs with me, as well as Drs. Bessie Young, Chad Allen, um, Grace John Stewart, Deepa Rao, India Ornelas, and Barbara Baquero as um, program or uh, um, core leads for each of the components of the grant. So if you're interested in learning more about the grant itself, I'm happy to talk about it in more detail, but I was, I was just going to share with you this um, overall summary as one of the um, approaches that we're using at ARCH. We want to support this um, um, you know, we want to continue and, and disseminate the strategies that we're learning as a part of ARCH and then also um, as a part of FIRST, as a part of partnerships with School of Public Health and others um, to be able to evaluate what, what is working in terms of fostering inclusive excellence. And so as ARCH director, I've been invited as a steering committee member for Framing the Future Initiative for the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. And then we'll also be sitting on the expert panel for um, the inclusive excellence through an anti-racism lens. And so really what we're striving to do is to um, um, be able to share out such that it's not just the impact here at the UW that we're able to inform the impact um, that's happening within public health, academic public health across the nation. We do want to support activism as anti-racist praxis for policy change. And here are some of the foci that we've identified in terms of um, focusing our efforts, anti-racist literacy and public health, reproductive justice, disrupting policing and incarceration, and justice and healthy aging. And then finally, centering the ways of knowing and being of individuals and groups most impacted by structural racism in our action steps. So really establishing structures and venues to provide space to value and uplift ideas and approaches. And I've shared with you some of the ways in which um, we're orienting ourselves to do that, um, to build a critical mass of Black and Native scholars in public health, and to support all faculty, staff, and students and institutions through informal mentoring. Um, it's something I've always done, something that we all are doing as, as faculty, but we also really to, need to make this more systematic in terms of incorporating anti-racist principles in our mentorship. So that is something that I'm in development with in terms of thinking through how we can, um, how we can um, implement that within the School of Public Health as well as across the university. I'm really interested in developing anti-racist leadership capacity. This is something that um, Rachel Hardeman um, at um, University of Minnesota and I have talked about and that we are going to be putting our heads together in terms of, of putting forward some recommendations. And then finally, the development of Indigenous and Black health curricula. And I'll just share, um, very um, happy to have partnered with um, Candace Jackson, co-founder of the African American Health Board to actually transform curriculum to focus and prioritize black reproductive health. And we did so by highlighting black and indigenous health professionals and community-based organizations. Um, actually hired um, her on as she was a professor. We co-taught, we co-developed the course, we co-implemented the course, we did everything um, together. And, and that was a tremendous experience in terms of essentially modeling to students how you can attend to uh, power asymmetries um, that might be um, stemming from you know, differences in terms of um, positionality related to institutions, positionality related to um, identity, positionality for many different reasons, but um, Anyway, I was, I'm looking forward to figuring out what the next iteration of this is. Um, and so I just want to thank you all so very much. I wanted to share with you our launch for the center. Um, our countdown is in seven days. Um, we are officially launched on February 23rd, um, 2022. And then I would also just really like to thank um, the following Ana Mascareñas, um, Sammy Ennevel, Mina Sharif, and Monica McLemore, who've just really been shoulder to shoulder with me in terms of doing the nitty gritty 
and, and helping spinning up Arch. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I would love to open it up for questions, comments, discussion. That was fantastic, Wendy. Thank you so much. We do have um, a question in the Q&A from Jim Guadino, um, who is asking about um, whether or not their plans, and I think you covered this after he posted the question to a certain extent, but what are the plans for sort of capacity building with respect to incorporating anti-racist principles into um, practice partner organizations? So I think I'm in the process of kind of thinking through like how, how ARCH can, I guess, formalize that. Um, I'm doing it informally right now. <laughs> and so, um, yes, I'm really interested in partnering. Um, the way that I've been working um, right now is just essentially serving as a, as a collaborator, as a team member, um, and thinking through how we can actually implement some of these principles in whatever the program is, whatever the program components are. Um, and so um, being able to kind of put together a, a framework and approach is actually part of my work that I proposed for um, the PARCAG proposal. So, you know, there's there's a lot of, of community knowledge in terms of implementation of decolonizing and anti-racist practices, but there really isn't a place where that has been translated into organizational behavior. And so that's where I'm really interested in, in spending some of my scholarship in partnership with, with communities. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. So Jim, I know you're in Oregon, but this is a good opportunity for me to give a plug for the Washington State Public Health Association um, and remind everyone who's a member of WSPHA that you should have gotten an email this week from them about voting on, and hopefully voting to approve, um, a resolution um, that they have put forward that um, racism is a public health crisis. Um, so just a reminder to people, your vote counts, so get out and vote. And, uh, and also that um, uh, racism and anti-racism will be um, themes for the fall WSPHA meeting in Wenatchee, um, which is also another great opportunity in terms of um, coordinating with, with practice partners as well. Um, it looks like we have a question from Juanita, also in the Q&A. She says, Dr. Barrington, this is incredibly motivating. Many of our undergraduate students have been expressing interest in working with ARCH for quite some time. Can you envision ways to include undergrads in the work of ARCH? Thank you. Absolutely. So um, in my, in my wearing my nursing hat, I work with undergrads all the time as part of um, the honors program. And so it's really around kind of incorporating um, undergrads and research teams. You know, the evaluation and research that's gonna be coming out of ARCH um, is, I'm hoping just to expand as we bring more people in and and people are able to kind of um, tuck in their their um, their uh, priorities and kind of their activities under the umbrella of arch. And so as that begins to be built out, there's going to be more and more opportunities for students. So I also would also really recognize that ARCH is not just a research entity, you know, although it was, I think, initially kind of um, message that, but I'm recognizing that from communities of students, from communities outside of the UW, you know, that we really want to have supports and um, opportunities for students that aren't necessarily directly tied to research. And so I think there are also um, going to be, I will definitely be figuring, and this will be a part of the student advisory board process, is for them to help me understand what students want and, and how we can actually um, do some work together to kind of um, actualize those priorities. It, there's also a question in the chat from Teresa Ward who says, thank you, Wendy, great work here. And thinking about your collaborations with community partners and teaching UW courses, um, how do you ensure these community members and yourself get compensated, particularly for schools on nine month contracts, any ideas? Thanks, Teresa. I think um, 
In order for the funding to, I'm still exploring um, how I'm going to essentially, what I want to do is fund the core budget of, of ARCH so that it can actually pay for community partners to be involved in our work with us. And so I think a lot of that funding likely is going to be coming from philanthropy. Um, so it's essentially writing grants for um, doing this kind of work. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that. Um, I know for myself in terms of, you know, working um, over the, the last fall quarter, you know, under the auspices of ARCH, you know, I was able to um, have my own um, effort paid for by the center and therefore the effort from the school, I was able to give to the community partner in order for them to be able to kind of be equitably, equally compensated, recognized for their expertise. Um, so um, I think there we can be some, we can do some creative thinking in terms of what that looks like. I've talked about in the past and, and I need to revisit this in terms of talking to faculty senate about how can we incorporate a, a, a community faculty rank, <laughs> you know, in terms of especially how can we tie that to our Carnegie designation as a community um, engaged um, institution. So, I mean, I think there's opportunities for us to retrofit, reimagine our current structures to be able to um, be inclusive of community expertise, um, community scholars, um, and, and being able to help them make our decisions with us because quite frankly, the decisions that we've just been making on our own have not been um, in the service of the communities who have been most impacted by structural racism. So two things, one, um, Jim Guandina mentions that the Oregon Public Health Association apparently also has um, been pushing for um, racism as a public health crisis bill to be passed, which is awesome. Um, and then I don't know if you can see the, the comment from Amy, I think just wanting perhaps to have you expand a little bit more on um, using the term stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So this was something that I'm learning every day. So in my work with my um, partners, um, with the um, evaluation of the Care Connect Washington, the Pobladoras, um, this was something that was brought to my attention in terms of the use of the word stakeholder. Um, and so that was something that I've learned, you know, through my public health training. That's how we identify people who have an interest or, um, you know, are willing to invest. And even using that as a term, you know, has connotations that are kind of rooted in capitalism. But, um, you know, this isn't the way that the relationships are conceptualized, valued um, by that particular community. And I, I imagine that's maybe also true among other communities. And so, um, you know, in terms of being very specific in, in asking or in describing, you know, what their role is, I think is probably more appropriate, but I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. So power mapping. So question being, I you know, using stakeholder as kind of a way of, of trying to identify like people's investment, you know, whether it's, you know, what is that investment based on? I think, I think maybe that's the question in terms of, of how the paradigms that we've been kind of using in public health to be able to kind of determine that. So just kind of being open to kind of rethinking that. And so I've been using, um, you know, essentially the same practices in terms of identifying those who have the most, maybe it's more in terms of those who are most impacted or those who are going to be the most affected um, and talking about them in terms of being partners or potential partners um, rather than stakeholders. Since we have a couple more minutes, there was a comment that Jim Krieger put in earlier and I think he said he had to go over to another meeting, but it was such an interesting question that I think it's worth going back to. You have to scroll way up to find it. Um, but he, he wanted to, to see if you could elaborate some on what your approach will be 
um, for sharing um, power with affected communities and specifically how decisions that ARCH will be made and by whom, um, given that seeding of power is such an important um, aspect of this work and all of our work, um, mm -hmm. but also super challenging. That's a great question. And, and this is something that I'm still working with with my partners to figure out. The way that I've been thinking and, and, and proposing is that, you know, if we're if we're having specific entities um, that are coalescing and coming together as collectives to be able to kind of discuss, advise um, whatever the issue is, but there will be members from, from those entities who will sit on a kind of a larger um, arch strategic council is what I'm calling it. And that council is going to be making decisions. So whether that is going to be by voting or whether, I don't know how, I think it's participatory. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming in saying this is how I think it should be, or this is how it will be. I really think it's important to work with, with partners to figure out, okay, collectively, how do we want this to be? Um, how do we want to implement this? So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I probably can have a better answer once I'm further along and, and, and when we've actually done it. Yeah, though, I mean, I, part of what I really appreciate, Wendy, about your approach is that you are um, so committed to input at every stage and, um, and that you resist the temptation. I know everyone wants you to just give them a, like, this is what it's gonna be. Um, and that I love that you're resisting that temptation and really keeping an open mind in terms of what are you gonna hear from um, the groups that you work with um, and that you want to arch to be centered on um, so that they have real voice. And that's really lovely. So for instance, like one of the one of the thing, one of the decisions that has been made is, you know, we wanted to explicitly write in um, black voice as a part of the arch structure. I mean, that came from the Black Advisory Collective. And so it's there. So I mean, I'm starting with the Black Advisory Collective as a starting point to make these decisions, but then building out the structure to include other partners who will also be able to shape the decisions moving forward. Yeah, that's so exciting. And so different from our normal way of operating within academia. It's really lovely. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any questions that I have missed. I would say, if, if I have missed your question, feel free to repost it at the bottom of the chat so that we see it. Um, I'm seeing a comment by um, Jim in terms of how, you know, even though you're trying to engage that it's often difficult and that power is actually not seated. And um, that is, extremely challenging. I mean, I, one of the things I talked about with, with PARCAG is like being able to identify each member's kind of um, sphere of influence and what are the actual decisions that they have direct control over and, you know, who is it that they need to also kind of bring on board in terms of like, if there's decisional authority that may not rest entirely with them, you know, how can we reach out to, to, to bring that person or that entity along? And, you know, I know there's a level of, of um, I guess, um, saying, okay, I know that I can do this, so I'm gonna do it. Um, but then being able to kind of find out how that looks uh, for partners as well. Um, and so that's been, that's an evolving, that's a continual process for me. I can just kind of share what my commitment is and actually demonstrate by doing that I'm actually doing it rather than just saying it and just hoping that others can, can do the same who are in positions to do so. Yeah. Well, we are right at the hour. I wanna thank you again, Wendy. I also wanna thank, um, there's a whole group of people who worked on 
um, bringing the idea of Arch together years ago. This before before I joined the School of Public Health, um, who had this vision of the of Arch and worked for so many years. You were one of those people who worked served on search committees early on. Um, you know, looking for um, the ideal leader for this um, this center and helping to make sure that it stayed front and center in terms of our priorities within the school. So just huge thanks to all of them for their patience um, and their fortitude as we navigated through those spaces and just intense gratitude that, um, that we found you and that you were in a position where you were interested and ready and excited to take on this challenge. Um, at a time when we as a school are just really ready to move forward with you and support you. So just really thrilled to have you here and can't wait to see what you and all your collaborators um, do. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us and um, have a great February, I guess. Happy Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Happy Black History Month, everyone.